science is constantly pushing the boundaries of what's possible. But for a few women, the odds are so stacked against them, they told they'll never carry a baby of their own, like Jenny. So when did you first think that there might be a problem then, Jen? I think I was probably about 15, 16, and I had to go and have an ultrasound because I was having some abdominal pain. And I was called in to see one of the consultants who sort of sat in front of me and looked at me in a certain way and I thought, oh, there's really something wrong here and you get that feeling in your stomach. Yeah. And then she said, I don't really know what to tell you. You have a condition called MRKH and you were born without a womb. I, I remember saying to her, so does that mean I can't have children? And she shrugged and said, I, I, I really don't know what I can say. And that was it, no further support, no advice? No. I felt like the world had dropped out. And I went and locked myself in the bathroom and sat on the floor and just cried and oh. cried. And how do you feel now then? You know, nearly 30. Yeah. Is a family something you want? Mm. Eventually. Have you thought about the options that are open to you then? Women with MRKH actually are quite lucky in a way because we're born with ovaries and eggs and some women don't have that. No. Um, so we are able to have our own biological children, we just can't carry them. No. Um, so there's agencies in the UK that can link you up with women that are interested in being mm. surrogates. So I'm lucky enough that I have two older sisters who have both said that they'd love to do it. So let's start over here. Four years ago, Swedish surgeon Mats Brandström made an extraordinary breakthrough that could transform the lives of people like Jenny. He became the first person in the world to successfully transplant a womb from one woman to another. A 61-year-old woman gave her womb to a family friend. That pioneering operation has led to six more transplants and five healthy babies so far. Jenny now runs a support group for women without wombs, and she's come to Sweden to find out more about this new technique. So this is actually the story about uh, the first baby and I delivered the baby myself and mm. uh, this was a very special moment. Yeah. Uh, and uh, to hear the first cry and so on. And uh, mm. so of course that's something I will always remember. Yeah. yeah. Today he's one and a half year almost and he walks and he's a very happy baby. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. So obviously there's lots of women back home that are really excited about this sort of step forward in, in treatment. So if I go home and the women and the girls say to me, is this something that's, that's going to be a, an option for me in the future, what would you recommend that I say? If it uh, comes into clinic, which I'm sure it's going to be, I think it's going to be a routine procedure in five to ten years in many, many countries around the world. And of course including UK, because you've done a lot of research in the UK and you're now starting your first trial, so definitely. Hello. Hi. Mats has arranged for Jenny to meet Cash, his fourth womb transplant baby, along with Cash's father, Patrick. You're beautiful, aren't you? Womb transplants could help thousands of British women in the future. Do you want to cuddle? Even though I know that that's not going to be the road that I'll go down, it's the girls in my support group that will potentially be able to benefit from it which is fantastic because, you know, they might get this and that's, that's amazing because I don't want them to have to, to go through what I've been through. He is solid. <laughs> <laughs> to be able to see someone else who has gone through what I've gone through and yet had the magic wand that I wanted. It's amazing. Oh, he's so soft and warm. Mm -hmm.